So if you're like me and you like Michael Pollan's writing, I think you're going to love this video. Not many people have seen it so far. As of right now, it's at under 7,500 views. But Michael Pollan, the guy who wrote How to Change Your Mind and was a huge driving force in changing people's perceptions about psychedelics and also highly influential in the other books he's written, is writing a new book. And in this video, he's interviewing a scientist for the book. So if you like Pollan's work, the content of this video is probably going to be a prominent idea in there. Now, the scientist that he's interviewing isn't just any scientist. This is Michael fucking Levin, who has some of the most wild, fucking wild ideas about biology, bioelectricity, yes, bioelectricity, bioengineering, and what it means to be alive and conscious. I know everyone's on a neuroscientist and longevity kick lately with lots of videos like, hello, I'm a neuroscientist. I'm going to tell you how to live your life even though I mostly study mice. Anyhow, this guy is the answer that both sides have been looking for. I'm predicting that in the way people are pushing pseudoscience and hiding it behind words like quantum, they are soon going to start using words like bioelectric in the same way. Mark my words, Joe Dispenza is going to have a book on this soon. But before that concept creep kicks in, I'm going to link to some Michael Levin videos below as he's done some amazing Frankenstein level science, stuff beyond what I imagined was possible. And he's not selling books either. Well, not yet, at least. He's just doing great science and sharing all of his ideas without a paywall. And I highly respect him for that. If you also have tried to read some academic articles online and have been paywalled and not been able to access them, I haven't encountered any paywalls with his work. It's all freely accessible. He's very generous with all this awesome work that he's doing. Anyhow, this video that I'm talking about in particular is altogether great. But it really picks up at around the 45 minute mark where they start to talk about whether thoughts need to have a thinker. Can there be thoughts without a thinker? It's a really fascinating question. And it's the name of a really great book by Mark Epstein. Michael Levin's answer, though, is one that has got me really, really excited. The way that he tackles this question is by breaking it into two parts. So he says like the distinction here is between a pattern, which would be thoughts, and a real solid thing, which is the thinker. Your body is material, but your thoughts aren't material, right? That seems to be the intuition, or at least something that was intuitive for me for a long time. And so from this angle, he starts building an argument just so deliciously. So he puts thoughts on this kind of continuum. He begins by saying that some of us have persistent intrusive thoughts. Not all of us do, but some of us do. These are thoughts that are unwelcome to us, but yet they keep arising. I've definitely experienced this before, and I think some of you might have experienced this as well. The master move that Levin does here is to draw attention to the fact that these thoughts do some niche construction. And that is a fucking banger of an observation right on. Just like how a beaver constructs a dam to make their environment more hospitable, some of our persistent and intrusive thoughts shape their environment so that they can persist longer. Our bodies and our environments are what the thoughts are constructing. If you're having dark thoughts, you might feel low energy, for example, and not want to go outside into the sunshine. So you sit in a dark environment with the curtains drawn under your blankets and you don't move much, which is the perfect environment to allow these thoughts to populate more. The thoughts are changing their environment. Really, they're changing your environment for their own survival, which is why for Mental Health Week, they're talking about moving more for mental health, meaning a lot of mental health disorders are probably self-perpetuating by disabling us and keeping us sedentary. Just look at the link between depression and chronic illness, for example. Now, Michael Levin doesn't go that far, mind you. He's very clear to say that he's not a qualified psychotherapist. Neither am I, for the record, if you couldn't tell. He just said that persistent intrusive thoughts do niche construction. And so I fleshed out that implication in ways that I think make sense. Next, he has another banger of an observation. Now, some people with multiple personalities create different personality alters. So they construct their settings and environments 
for these different personality alters to thrive, or as I would playfully say, their alter egos, right? And you could see this in some extreme examples of egotism. Kobe Bryant was the Black Mamba when he was on the basketball court, but he wasn't the Black Mamba off the basketball court, at least I don't think he was. Musicians have stage names and often don't act at home the way they do on stage. Drake on stage is different than Aubrey at home. You could just ask Kendrick Lamar. He's got a whole lot of music about that. Influencers have their usernames and their monikers and they create content for their brand, for their channel, which is channeling attention to their alter egos. And lots of YouTubers are different off screen, let me tell you. Again, let me say, Michael Levin doesn't use these examples that I've given, but he just briefly talks about personality alters. But I've added to that as well in a way that I think makes sense. So please tell me if I'm missing the mark here. And then the next step in this continuum is when we get into full-blown personalities who go to jobs and buy houses and clothes and feed themselves to keep their patterns going. They construct their niches to keep their egos alive. So we went on a spectrum of thoughts here, a spectrum of patterns from intrusive thoughts to different personalities to our full-blown personalities, all of which change your environments to keep themselves going, though some of them are more successful than others. And then here's another banger of a thought by Levin. These patterns also spawn up smaller, less complex patterns. Now, my explanation of that is just like we do in babies. Their complexity at birth, though it is vast, it isn't as complex as that of adults, as they have a difficult time in self-perpetuating. They need to be taken care of until they could self-perpetuate. Though with these rent prices and inflation lately, it really is becoming a lot more difficult to do that, isn't it? Sure is. And so let's get back to the original question here. Can we have thoughts without a thinker? So what if the thoughts, our personalities, make sub-thoughts in babies or in companies or in music, for example? Where's the distinction between the thought and the thinker then? Can the thinker's thoughts think their own thoughts? Is it just turtles all the way down? And some of these patterns are fleeting, like a quick thought or a song that's stuck in our head for a couple of days or like a fantasy that we want to live out but then kind of change our minds or they could be longer like the full lives of humans or even longer than that like the lives of very old trees or of jupiter's red dot or the sun now let's go into an even deeper mind fuck this is a total mind fuck okay are you ready his next step is to mention that patterns can be substrate independent. So thoughts don't need brains. For example, waves don't need to be waving anything in order to be waves, like electromagnetic waves, like light waves. These waves are self-reinforcing, self-perpetuating without a substrate, without the need of anything physical for them to exist. You know what other scientists talk about when they mention substrate independence? consciousness that's what according to a lot of the scientists and the philosophers that i've been reading and listening to our consciousness is also substrate independent weird yeah i know when our consciousness though wants to do niche construction so as to keep itself alive it and now this is what michael levin says is what some people would say incarnates now i thought it was very wise that he said other people would use this word because incarnates for me has a very big connotation. For me, incarnation is a very Buddhist idea, as in reincarnation, which in this argument that Michael Levin lays out really kind of maps on perfectly in that these self-perpetuating patterns incarnate. They change their environments so that they can keep occurring, which is why now, this is my take here. This is why we keep dating the same kinds of people. We keep getting into the same kinds of relationship with the same kinds of issues, which is why we talk to our parents the same way and keep perpetuating suffering on ourselves. All right, so let's go a little bit deeper here. How do we stop these patterns from niche construction? Because 
we don't necessarily want all of our thoughts to have control over our environments, right? How do we stop these thoughts from constructing environments that keep them alive, but keep the rest of us unhappy? Or how do we free ourselves from this reincarnation? So now this is time for another Buddhist idea. I'm going to say that we do this with awareness and with the breath. Be aware of this pattern and breathe into it. Give it space, but don't give it control over your situation so it doesn't construct your niche and perpetuate itself. Passively and non-violently resist. Sit with it. Breathe into it. It will echo in your mind, but then it will get quieter and quieter until eventually it's extinguished. It blows away. It fades like a candle. And we become enlightened and awake and see that we are in nirvana. Ah, we sure got into some woo-woo there for a bit now, didn't we? I'm afraid of sounding a bit like Deepak Chopra and bastardizing science and misconstruing it to fit my narrative, but I do think that I did justice to what Michael Levin had to say. And I am very open to hearing where I missed a plot and got distracted. I'm not attached to these ideas. I'm just excited about them. Please point me in the right direction if I'm wrong here. I just got very excited about the idea that patterns construct their own niches. And I think it's a very useful framework to map onto other ideas that are common in the landscape of thought. This framework opens up a bunch of implications though, pseudoscience aside. Namely, there's still a kind of dualism problem here with the idea of thoughts and thinkers being different and distinct when they are not as distinct as we think. The mind and the body are one. And as soon as we draw boundaries and name our binaries, we'll find ways to blend them. In this case, drawing distinction between thoughts and thinkers becomes not really that easy. But that's an entirely other discussion. Another idea that could slip in, and I am feeling resistant to this, so please forgive me if I sound a little harsh here. <sighs> but this kind of leaves the door open for manifestors to come in here and say, Yes, mama, just got to manifest your destiny and be your best self. Which, from the manifestors that I've spoken with, they get caught up in prayers and wishful thinking when niche construction is kind of more active than just hoping to be saved by saying the magic words and praying because you don't want to actually do the work. Now, not all manifestors are like this, mind you. I just worry that some magical thinking can sneak in here with the idea of patterns and niche construction. That's it. I hope that didn't sound too harsh. The second thing that slips in here, though, and something that I think is a lot more welcome, is the importance of affirmations. Speak to yourself more kindly. It'll do a lot of good for the world that you want to build around yourself. Really. Which is another way of saying, watch the words you use. Watch what ideas you let enter your body. And there's some really toxic shit out there. We're still watching actors pretend to murder each other on our screens. We're still listening to music and lyrics written by artists with really poor relationship skills and we internalize those lyrics and they change how we act in our relationships in turn. These patterns construct niches in our destructive relationships. Just like if we eat junk food, it damages our bodies. So too, if we take in junk thoughts and junk language and junk visuals, they're gonna construct niches out of our bodies and environments that are gonna cause us a lot of mental harm. Let's stop with the good guys versus bad guys movies and feeding these thoughts of punishing the wicked. We can grow out of that into a much kinder way to interact with the people that we disagree with. Mm -hmm. Okay, now that's all I'm gonna say about this awesome video. Thank you so much, Michael Levin, for being endlessly awe-inspiring with your content. I love your videos and they get me so excited and I talk to all my friends about them. If you haven't seen his videos yet and haven't learned about the stuff that he's doing with frogs and skin cells and worms, you're in for a huge change in your worldview and how the world is going to look like in the next 100 years. It's amazing. Also, thank you for watching and please let me know what you think. I'd be very happy to chat with you about this in the comments. Thank you again. Bye-bye.